So I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the second in the webinar series that we're doing with PERSA. Uh, this one's called Watermarket Fundamentals and How to Make It Work for You. Uh, you'll see on the front here, we've got some acknowledgements that uh, I'm Rod Kahn with Marsden Jacob. I'm also being supported by Simo Turvin and, and Stuart McLaughlin from Marsden Jacob Associates. Uh, as an opening, I'd like to do the welcome to country. Um, an acknowledgement of country. As host of this webinar, I first need to acknowledge the traditional owners. As this meeting includes representatives from other parts of the country, it's important all of us to reflect, acknowledge and pay respects to traditional owners and their nations of the entire River Murray system. I recognise and acknowledge that the traditional owners and their nations of the River Murray have a deep and ongoing cultural, social, environmental, spiritual and economic connection to their lands and waters. On behalf of all of us joining in this webinar today, I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us here today. Um, firstly, I'd like to do some introductions um, and then just talk a little bit about the process that we're going to go through with these webinars, um, this, this two-hour session that we've got ahead of us now. Um, so firstly, introductions. I'm obviously Rod Carr with Marsden Jacob. Uh, in this first session, I'll also be joined by one of my colleagues, Stuart McLaughlin, who's a senior consultant with Marsden Jacob. And Jared Eaton has also uh, volunteered to also participate in the session from the department so that he can respond to questions. Uh, I'd note that this session is being recorded so that it can be loaded up onto, uh, and it will be available on YouTube uh, following um, the two hour session uh, so that you can review it afterwards. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the work that's been done by Persa Rural Solutions in putting this together and particularly to Tasha McGregor and Rachel Kelly, um, who provided a huge amount of assistance to us in putting together both the slides and the content and the framing uh, of this uh, water literacy program that we're doing. There will be a question, an opportunity for you guys to ask questions. If you have any questions, um, please jump onto the Q&A box. You should see on the screen a Q&A section. If you jump in there, type in your question and print, press send. Uh, one of my team, Amanda Lay, is sitting in the background and is capturing those as we go. Um, and we'll do our best to answer as many of your questions as we can. Um, and if we don't get to all of them, um, we'll endeavour to get back to you subsequently with, with responses or answers to those. But we hope to be able to answer as many of them as we possibly can through the sessions today. Um, in terms of what's the plan for the webinar, first of all, over this first uh, section of the webinar, we're gonna do a bit of a update on where things, uh, how things have evolved since the last uh, update that we provided. Um, that will go for about 40 minutes, followed by a Q&A session at the end of that. Um, and then after that, we will call this webinar to an end and you should have received a couple of links, but we'll also put them in the chat for you where you can make a choice. Then there are two half hour sessions. Um, so there'll be a risk management strategies session. And at the same time as that, we'll be running an emerging water market products session. And so if you choose to join one of those for half an hour, and then we basically give you, a, we will repeat those sessions again over another half hour. And so you can have the opportunity to participate in both of them. Um, the second half of the sessions will have the opportunity to be more interactive. So that um, we'll be running it such that if you've got a question or wanna ask something that you can raise your hand in those sessions and then uh, participants can basically be unmuted. But this first um, session that we're running through now, um, basically we ask you to submit any questions via the Q&A. Uh, a quick disclaimer. Um, the information that we're providing in this presentation does not constitute financial or other professional advice and is general in nature. Uh, we're basically here to give you an overview of the products available, how they'll be used in the marketplace, and it doesn't take into account your specific circumstances or requirements. So if you're thinking about using one of these, we encourage you to uh, undertake the research and get the advice that you need before you make that. Um, if you've asked a question in the Q&A and you want to direct it at someone in particular, please include the name of that person who you'd like to have answer it. Um, and as I said before, we'll look to answer as many questions as we possibly can. So at that point, I'm now going to jump into the slides. You should be able to see the first slide here, which is the webinar cover page. Um, 
the outline of the presentation today. We're going to give you an update and an outlook, basically looking at what's changed since the April webinar. I presume a number of you also listened in on that one. Um, we're also going to do a bit of a refresher about the basics. A big part of this exercise is uh, really helping people to understand the opportunities, but part of that is uh, working through some of the complexities and doing some 101 on markets. We're going to be talking about intervalley trade opportunities to South Australian irrigators. So the focus of this session is very much on irrigators and SA looking for opportunities and how do you uh, deal with intervalley trade considerations. And then we're going to look at water market products available to you that can help you manage uh, your requirements and also to manage risks. So a quick outlook, what's happened since the April webinar? So Southern Connected temporary system, well, prices have continued to soften, uh, not surprisingly because we've had some good inflows into the system. Um, dam storage levels, still got a way to go before we get up to the levels where we'd like to be. Um, but the bomb outlook is looking pretty positive at this point in time in terms of medium chance of rainfall um, is really quite high. And so the outlook remains good and not surprisingly what we've seen in the Southern Connected temporary market is a significant softening of market prices, um, which is a great way to the end of the year if you're looking to acquire a bit more water. The allocation outlook, um, we're indicating sort of low water availability with forecast water um, being, I guess, below under extreme dry and average circumstances where we thought they would be um, compared to 2019-20 and also below uh, the 10 year average, even under um, wet scenarios being in place. Um, let's have a look at how it's changed. So things have improved. Um, we've still got low water availability under the driest conditions, the extreme dye and the dry conditions, but the outlook has quite fortunately improved. Um, compared to where we were. And this is sort of based on what the outlook is like in terms of available allocation as at February 21. So um, I think that's good news, um, but it still means that with the amount of water that is likely to be available through allocation in the system, that water prices are going to remain uh, at more of an elevated level unless we see significant inflows into the system. Let's now move to some key concepts and definitions. And so this is what we've called the South Australian Water Markets 101 session. Um, one of the key things that confuses a lot of people who we talk to about water markets is the range of terminology that's out there. And as you can see from here, there's all sorts of different descriptions that apply for, I guess, effectively similar uh, issue or similar matters that are being considered. So across South Australia, Vic, New South Wales and Queensland, water entitlements go by slight different sorts of names. The usable portion could be called your allocation or your seasonal de determination or your available water determination or an announced allocation. Um, different terminology is applied to concepts such as permanent transfer, temporary transfer. Um, the regulated water sources could be called regulated as in Vic and New South Wales, prescribed water course as in South Australia or supplemented in Queensland, unregulated also has some different terminology. And then the entitlement types also have different names. So in South Australia, we tend to be talking about class one, three or five, when we're looking from an irrigation perspective. When we're in Victoria, we are talking generally about high and low reliability entitlements. New South Wales high in general security entitlements and Queensland high in medium priority entitlements. So that we put this together for you basically as a bit of a resource so that you can refer back to it and understand some of the differences uh, that are in place in terms of the terminology across the system. Let's look a little bit as well about how much water there is under these. Um, so this is just a brief summary for you. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it really highlights that class 3A, which has a quite high security character attached to it, is a very significant proportion of the entitlements on issue. 
Um, and it also benefits from some features around carryover and tradability and the like, which are not present for necessarily for some of the others. Uh, and this being the final slide in this quick overview, um, historical allocations. Um, there's a bit of information here, but in essence, what it shows you is if you look at the purple line, that's class 3A allocations in South Australia, um, depending obviously on the amount of water that's available in the system. Um, on the whole, 100% has been achieved over the last few years, but obviously the back end of the millennium drought um, allocations were constrained. Uh, if we look at the blue, which is high security zone 11, um, obviously it achieved nearly 100% allocations back end of the, of the drought. Um, and similarly, same sort of things with the high reliability zone seven. Um, but obviously what this highlights is how allocations build up over time. And that's just an important thing to always be mindful of is that an opening allocation, which may be lower, there is always the potential for that allocation to increase significantly over the course of the water year. Next, I wanna talk a little bit about um, inter-valley trade opportunities. So in, in putting together these slides, um, one of the things we wanna help everyone to understand is what are the opportunities that exist interstate for you guys as water users? Um, Rather than just looking at SA, how do you navigate a market that has inter-valley inter inter trading opportunities, but also a range of constraints? Um, and look, one of the reasons why uh, this exercise is being supported by HERSA and also by Marsden Jacob is that uh, one of the things that we've developed in recent times is a free application that I hope most, if not all of you, have now um, signed on to and it takes a fairly brief amount of time, but it's called Waterflow. Um, and Waterflow has in the back of it, a complex rules engine, uh, which helps you to navigate the market. And this is a visual representation of what sits in the back there. Basically what you can see is that allocations can be traded across catchments and state boundaries, effectively subject to state limits. Benefit of this is it increases the amount of market size that you have available um, if you start looking into state. So just highlighting what's possible from a zone 12 perspective, where you've got this sort of pinky purple color here, basically identifies where a trade of an allocation is always allowed. This is basically coming from, and this is going to. So you might be a seller or a buyer, um, and these are areas where it's always allowed. But equally, you can trade into other zones as well. But if you're trading into those other zones, you need to be mindful of the potential for limits to come into place. Um, and again, we've done this as a bit of a style, as a sort of visual representation of it. But you can see that if you were looking at zone 1A, a couple of things you might want to think about is the golden back trade limit and the upper golden back trade limit, depending on where you were trading from. Um, we're commonly asked about things like um, the potential for the Barma choke to kick in. So you can see that if you're trading with zone 6B or 6 or 10, there are scenarios where the Barma choke might kick in. Um, actually, you no, know, Barma chokes over here, 6 and 10, where you might actually have a constraint that emerges. Or you could have a lower broken back trade issue that emerges. So there's, there's a range of constraints that emerge in the market. Um, but we encourage you to be looking across the market and at broader opportunities um, in the market because you start bringing into play a lot more water potentially. And for comparison, there's 608 uh, gigalitres of class three water in South Australia, uh, about 938 gigalitres in Victoria zone seven, and then across New South Wales, you've got 164 gigs of high security in zone 11 and nearly 2000 gigalitres of general security uh, in terms of entitlements on issue. So there's a lot of water that could potentially be available subject to what is actually announced by the state as available allocations. But you need to be mindful of whether you can 
buy water or sell water into those as a function of what these different trade limits are doing at that point in time. And we'll talk a little bit about more though, those trade limits and how they work on the subsequent slides. So it's also important to think about things like uh, how the entitlements work and what characteristics they have on them. So here we talk about things like carryover capacity and what's available against the different entitlements in terms of carryover capacity by entitlement type and by class type. So that's also something that's worth thinking about in terms of your opportunity to access carryover. And basically, if you've got spare water this year and you want to carry it over to next year, you could carry it over, obviously, uh, on your existing allocation, assuming it has that ability attached to it. Or alternatively, you could look to see whether there might be an opportunity to carry it over interstate uh, on another license. Coming back to connectivity, it really underpins water delivery to South Australia. Um, under temporary, you know, under current rules, temporary water can always be traded to South Australia from a number of zones. And we've highlighted them on the map here for you. 6B and 7 and New South Wales zones 11 without limits. Um, so these are areas where um, the risk of a market constraint coming in and, and coming into play uh, is, is really mitigated. But there are a number of main trade limits out there. Ones, the key ones that you guys are presumably aware of include the Barma Choke, the Goldman IVT and the Mahambuji IVT. And I just want to run through some of those. So here's uh, the Barma Choke. Again, visually represented, you can see um, where the limits present from a seller and a buyer side. But equally what this graph shows you is how much is available. And you can see in here that there are significant periods of time when it's not possible to move water across the Barma Choke. And the Goulburn IVT is the same. So here's the Goulburn IVT, we've got it highlighted a green zone here. This is the area that's effectively affected by the presence of this limit. Um, and if you look at this trace here, it basically shows you at times you can move water in and at other times, you can, can't move water in, but you can take it out. And so it's quite volatile in terms of what you're seeing here because it's responding to effectively what the market is doing. A third key limit in the system is the Murrumbidgee IVT. Like the Goulburn, it can be closed in or out. Really depends on water availability and drivers as to whether which way it is and prices as to which way trading has gone. But it's really just important to note that it can restrict trade effectively in both directions. And in recent years, we have seen it switch. So you can see here a period where it was restricted one way and another period, recent times where it wasn't, it was the other way and, and it's reversed subsequently. So it's really important that if you're thinking about doing a trade into, um, of your water into the Murrumbidgee or you're buying water out of the Murrumbidgee, that you understand where the limit is at and that you take that into consideration when making your decision as to whether you're gonna be able to realize uh, the water that you've either sold in or uh, acquired out of that region. Um, lastly, and I'm gonna now hand over to my colleague, Stuart, um, I'd just like to flag that there are actually lots of great resources. I, I mentioned before that we've uh, put together Waterflow, which has a whole heap of free resources. But um, if you want to know more about the Barma Choke, then I would encourage you to go and have a look at the great resources on the MDBA website about the Barma Choke. Um, if you want to know more about what's happening in the Goulburn Murray and what's in particular happening um, in terms of the trade review, there's some great resources that have been put out by the department and they've released a number of documents and you can access them at this location on the water register. If you want to know more about the Victorian trading rules, uh, jump onto the trade rules site and the, Victoria, the New South Wales register also has a wealth of information on what's possible from the New South Wales side of the perspective. 
So I'm now going to hand over to Stuart, who's going to talk us through the managing risks part. Thanks, Rod. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. So today I'm just going to touch and uh, discuss on how water markets can help you manage for risk. Um, we're going to be uh, in the emerging water market session after this, we're going to be having some breakout sessions, which Rod, Rod will touch on. And in there, we're going to have a bit more of a detailed discussion on some of the risk facing businesses and, and how some of the options to reduce your risks from both traditional products and emerging market products. So this will be just a, a brief overview, but um, please join us in the uh, breakout session for more details. So if we consider really three key uh, overarching risks um, and water availability uh, is probably the key one and it's probably the most influential risk and that is where really the rainfall and allocation yield is not sufficient for your uh, watering requirements for that year and we've certainly seen that over the uh, over this recent year with uh, um, the significant droughts uh, there's been a reduced water availability and um, this is certainly a risk lots of people have been managing for. Temperature, similarly, um, over recent years, we've seen increasing periods of above average temperatures and even new, uh, new records set, especially across the Southern Connected. Um, uh, South Australia is frequently 44 degrees in summer, which uh, certainly uh, has an impact on uh, evaporation. Three, price. So we all know that there are a range of drivers affecting price uh, from rainfall to market sentiment to temperature. And so we really see these as three key overarching um, risks that we uh, are managing for. Next, we, uh, to help manage these risks, um, we're gonna just touch on some of the uh, options that we have available in terms of water market products. And this is not an exhaustive list. Um, there are others out there, options and, and, and so on, but these are really the five key ones. We've got our mature products, which got the temporary water, and we've got permanent entitlements. We've then got emerging, emerging and secondary products. And these are leases, forwards uh, and carryovers. And so next with the emerging and, and secondary products, uh, we can consider that what is uh, an entitlement lease? So an entitlement holder, a leasehold, that transfer complete access of the entitlement to a second party, a leasee, for a specified period of time. It might be one year, it might be multiple years. And at the end of that period, the access to the entitlement returns to the leasehold. So whilst the um, entitlement, whilst, whilst you if you have access to that um, entitlement lease, then you will see whatever allocations um, are given to that entitlement and, and that will be the water you will receive. Forward allocation trade. So allocation water is traded with a future delivery date and that's at an agreed price. Um, the date of delivery may be in the current water year or similarly, it might be over multiple water years. And lastly, carryover parking. So certain types of entitlements as Rod touched on, uh, they can allow unused allocation water to be carried over from one water year to another. So in carryover parking contract, a party with excess allocation water will place her, will rent the carryover space from an entitlement holder to carry water over. That parked allocation is then returned to the placer in the following year. There are um, some considerations which we'll touch on in the breakout, such as um, risk of spill and how that might impact um, on what water you receive once the water is um, changed over or whether that um, risk of spill is placed on you or placed on the holder, depending on the um, contract that's set out. And so we can see here that really the timeline, this just shows uh, an overview of uh, when each of these products can be delivered um, and I, there's a question here that, um, yes, these slides will be available um, at the end. So I know there's a lot of detail in here, so don't worry, um, they will be available for you to um, sift through when we're finished um, and review. Um, 
And so forward allocation and entitlement lease, we've got multi-year delivery options, carryover parking, allocation transferred to the parking license, then in the next year, allocations returned, permanent and temporary trade with occurring within the uh, ward, one water year. And next, we uh, will, Rod, will you briefly touch on the breakout sessions? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So, um, so that you guys are aware, um, in the next part, so we're going to have a bit of a Q&A session now, and I noticed that we've had a few questions that would be good to respond to in the next several minutes. Um, but following um, the end of the question and answer stage of this, we'll then have two breakout sessions um, that I mentioned before. Um, the first breakout session is called Emerging Water Products. Um, and we'll be taking a look, closer look at three different products, their characteristics and really how they can help you with managing risks. So we've given you a very quick intro uh, in the slides, Stuart, that you've just presented, but we'll be looking a bit further at forwards, leases and parking. It'll be a half hour session. Um, we'll be looking at those for the first 10 or 15 minutes and then basically opening it up for questions from participants. Uh, while that's happening, there will be a second session running, which is entitled Risk Management Strategies. Um, and in that, we're gonna go through some case studies uh, where we look at sort of illustrating some of the options that uh, you have available to you to utilize market products with a focus on um, mitigating risks in the next water year. Um, Basically, we'll be talking through some of the options that you have available, depending on your circumstances. Um, and there'll be some illustrative options in there. Um, here's, here's a bit of a teaser as to uh, what you might see in there if you are a grower. Uh, we look at some of the options around whether you're parking it in Victoria or New South Wales, or selling allocation and purchasing it forward. Um, so there's a range of different scenarios that a grower can face. Um, so we'll be running through a series of scenarios on that to look at how those options might um, be beneficial to you in, in terms of your considerations. Obviously, as I mentioned before, none of this is financial advice, um, but basically the intention of these sessions is really to help you to understand uh, the options and the opportunities uh, that you have available to manage risk both within um, South Australia, but also most particularly um, from an interstate perspective and from um, an emerging um, product perspective as well. So we've had a few questions I note coming in on the chat line. Um, and as I mentioned before, we've also got Jared Eaton who's available to support us. Um, with responding to some of these questions. And so um, given we're now uh, finished that first part of the presentation, I would suggest we switch across and, and answer questions for about 10 or 15 minutes. It depends on how many questions, so keep the questions coming. Um, and, and we'll endeavor to answer as many as we possibly can. Um, and then we'll have a brief uh, break for five minutes, and then we will open up the breakout sessions. So um, what will happen is when we move to the breakout sessions, we'll ask you to basically move on to whichever of these uh, you're looking to move to first. And we hope you can stay for both because you have opportunity over the hour to, to participate in both. Um, if you're going to risk management, you'll need to click on the risk management strategies link first. And then for the second half hour, you'll need to click on the emerging water products session second or vice versa, depending on where you're at. Okay, so let's have a look at the questions that we've got that have come in uh, via the chat line. Thank you everyone for the questions that you have been posting. Um, Jared, there's one here that I wonder, Jared, if you're in a position to help us answer. Um, and it's around, do we think that constraints on delivery via the Barmer choke 
are likely to impact the market and and access. And I guess I can answer a bit of that to start with, but Jared, I expect you might have perspectives on this as well. So obviously the bummer choke does impact on the market. It, it effectively results in um, sub-markets emerging once um, the, the choke uh, trade limit is at a point where transfers across the choke are closed uh, in one direction or another. So that means that water may not be available uh, that would otherwise be available for trading if the choke was open. Jared, do you have any further comments on what might be anticipated around the choke? It's a very good question, Rod, and certainly what you've uh, said there is correct. Um, I guess one of the challenging issues to deal with at this point in time is the eroding capacity at the Barma choke as well. So while we're talking about uh, trade opportunities, delivery of water downstream of the Barma choke, is also another uh, big issue which uh, the states are currently dealing with and what we've seen over time is a progressive reduction to the capacity of uh, the Barma choke to be able to deliver on some of the downstream uh, requirements as well. So there are certainly issues there. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority is uh, currently looking at different options around how you can improve the capacity of the choke and how you can bypass uh, the Barma choke which they currently do through using uh, Murray irrigation escapes at uh, Mawala Canal. And while I've got you there, Jared, there's another one here, which I think, I wonder if you might also respond to. Um, one of the participants said, interested in understanding rules of parking water interstate. Yep. That's a very good question again. Um, certainly there are a lot of people who look at uh, parking water interstate in particular, uh, Victoria seems to be one of the, uh, the go-to places in terms of uh, parking water. We strongly encourage uh, people to go and have a look at uh, the websites which are available in Victoria, particularly the DELP website that has a lot of uh, good information in there about uh, the rules associated with uh, parking water interstate. But certainly if people are looking to do that as an option, uh, to be able to put water upstream for next year, for example. Uh, we strongly encourage people to go and talk to a water broker about that. Um, certainly one thing to look for if you are uh, entering into arrangements with uh, someone upstream to park that water is be very aware of the contractual obligations that are put in place. Uh, there's a whole range of issues that people need to be aware of around risk of spill and the like, which uh, that would obviously have implications for whether people may or may not park water interstate. Yeah, it's a really important point, Jared, isn't it? The sense that there's some great resources out there from the Victorian side, but also uh, I fall in the same camp. It's really important to get some good advice on this if you're thinking about doing it. There's a number of uh, really excellent brokers out there who really understand what the options and the opportunities are. Yep. Uh, if someone's thinking about doing some um, parking of water interstate so that they've got it available um, next year. Um, and, uh, you know, I always encourage people to be looking to work with brokers who are with the Australian Water Brokers Association personally because of their codes of practice and the like. Uh, while we've got you, Jared, um, there's a couple of questions that have come in around quarterly meter balancing that I imagine you can see there. Um, and how decision-making works on those. Yep. Is there any commentary you can add on that? Yeah, I guess uh, obviously the current government policy is that uh, people need to undertake that uh, quarterly reconciliation to ensure that they have uh, sufficient water on their accounts to cover off use. So this is a obviously a relatively new policy um, that has uh, come into place and it's certainly a lot different to the end of year reconciliation, which uh, people previously uh, undertook. So we strongly encourage people uh, to avoid any of the uh, potential, I guess, financial penalties that come along with not being compliant at the end of each quarter to uh, make decisions quite early uh, in the quarter about ensuring they have sufficient water on their accounts to cover off on the water use for that quarterly period. Thanks so much, Jared. Um... Now, in terms of, okay, I think I've got a question here. Stuart, you might want to answer this one. Cost-effective interstate options to carry over unused South Australian water. So someone's obviously got a bit of water in their account and they're thinking about their options. 
it's a, strikes me as a, uh, aligning with the session that you'll be running next in terms of the risk management strategies consideration. Yeah, that's that's correct. So in, in the risk management, we're going to be running through, um, if we've got time, two case studies. Uh, we're going to be looking at, you know, you've got a grower that's got 500 megalitres um, at the end of the season. Um, they've got some unused allocation. What, what, what are their options? And we'll go through interstate options, options within South Australia. And so we'll be touching on a range of products that they can use and, and the current costs, um, looking at using the current market prices and what that'll mean for them in the long term. And there's a few questions emerging on the mechanics of parking water. And you've already mentioned that for us, that you're in essence, you're striking arrangement with another person, another water license holder, in essence, aren't you, Stuart, that uh, enables you to park your allocation so that it's available for you uh, when you want it at, at an agreed point next year. But there are risks and considerations that need to be borne in mind around that as well. Yeah, that's correct. So there'll be more about that in that risk management strategies case study section. So if you're interested in thinking about your options and balancing what the, the things that you need to consider in terms of cost, for instance, across your options, I'd encourage you um, to jump into that section of the exercise. Um, I've got a question here, which is around what are your recommendations for buying high security uh, permanent water uh, for the Riverlands? And, um, look, uh, candidly, it's not something that we can answer straight up like this. This is something that the mind really needs to be framed in the context of what it's being used for. So I'm sorry to whoever asked that question. Um, uh, we're happy to have a chat at some other time uh, after this, but um, really my, my firm recommendation always is on that side of things that you need to really be making decisions that are very cognizant of uh, your situation as, as a user of water and ensuring that you're effectively aligning um, the product type that you're looking to acquire with the way you're using water on your farm and the level of security and reliability uh, that you're looking to achieve um, and that, that it's well placed to support you. Um, Jared, if I can turn back to you for the next question, when will my South Australian carryover water be available for use in the 2020-21 water year? Is the next question. And I think I just have to, yep, there you go, Jared. Uh, thanks, Rod. Yep, very good question again. Um, so the process around notification uh, to people about when private carryover would be made available will be in September 2020. And there's a couple here who obviously were not aware about the opportunity to carry over water. Jared, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because it is an opportunity. In... No, absolutely, it is an opportunity for people. Um, certainly anyone that holds a Class 3A entitlement in South Australia uh, can have access to uh, private carryover then if the Minister grants access uh, to that. Um, we had an arrangement brought into a place called South Australia's Storage Right. Um, that was a change that was made around about eight years ago now in terms of getting a formal carryover right for South Australia uh, in the upstream storages and we've had that right in place now for obviously it's about eight years and we've at this current point in time we have uh, just over 100 gigalitres set aside in Dartmouth Reservoir to meet future private carryover requirements. And how does that, what, what are the considerations in that? So you can carry over up to 20%, Jared, is that? That's correct, yes. Um, but then that's subject to the amount of water that is then in turn made available through allocation decisions? That's correct. So when the so from a state level, we apply uh, carryover to when the minimum opening allocation is at 50% uh, or less. And Rod, you're right, it's based on the unused allocation of up to 20% of the class three entitlements. And just noting that um, 
allocations plus private carryover cannot exceed 100%. Also around River Murray carryover, uh, obviously the final water meter readings need to be in by 31st of July. Uh, there's no application required uh, for private carryover. Our licensing department uh, look at uh, the numbers in terms of what the carryover eligibility uh, would be during August. Uh, we go through a process of uh, calculating what the carryover uh, allocations would be. And then in September, uh, those eligible participants are I guess, informed of their uh, carryover volume. Fantastic. Thanks, Jared. That's look, I think that's that's the level of you know detail that's really beneficial for everyone out there to understand how this works and how it can work um, to your advantage. Um, but also what you know what the considerations are where that's concerned as well. Um, I've got an interesting question here that I might actually direct to Simo Turvenen from our team. Um, could we make some comments about the prevalence of deferred delivery arrangements and how they and the difference to forward contracts? Yeah, thanks, Rod. Yeah, uh, deferred delivery is basically another emerging secondary market product that has been out there for a couple of years. It's been offered by some of the uh, brokers and uh, exchanges. So basically, it's very similar to an in-season forward contract. So you basically lock in the price of water uh, now uh, and get it uh, delivered and, and paid uh, later if you're a water buyer. So for a water buyer, the difference to an in-season forward, uh, well, there is no difference basically. Uh, you pay a deposit, you lock in the price today and, and, and get it delivered uh, at a uh, uh, later stage. For, for the uh, seller of water though, there is a difference uh, in a way that if you are selling your water through a deferred delivery contract, you get your payment up front, so you don't have to wait for that water to be delivered to, to, to the buyer. Uh, the other main difference is that, uh, as far as I know, typically these deferred delivery products are only offered during the current season, so you can't lock in the price now and get it delivered next year with deferred delivery, but with forward contracts, you can. So those would be the main difference. In terms of the prevalence, uh, it, it's a niche product. So uh, even compared to a forward allocation trade, uh, the uh, deferred delivery product is, it's still emerging and you know it, it's, it hasn't really taken off, uh, but yeah, it does have some benefit to the uh, participants it can offer. Simo, while I've got you there, another question if I can. So one of the participants has asked, buying permanent Vic water above choke, can we register for auto transfer of temporary water to ourselves whenever allowed? Yeah, uh, very good question. So obviously the, the Barmak choke limit can, and it, it has impacted uh, uh, allocation trades from above to below choke this year whole season. Uh, the answer to the question is is yes and no. Like, there is, is no like a state government or MDBA uh, product of, or, or a vehicle you can sign up to. So th there is no such automated uh, transaction offered by uh, the governments. Uh, it, however, some of the intermediaries uh, can help you with that. Uh, obviously, uh, as, as you may know, these limits, they change very quickly. So they may not be able to guarantee that your water will get across, but I would suggest you to, to talk to an intermediary about this. Thanks, Simo. Um, just looking through some of the other questions here, has quarterly balancing, and Simo, you may wanna stay on and comment on this one as well. Has quarterly balancing reduced opportunities to get access to both cheap temporary and lease water and um, what's happening in that area? I guess uh, we've got to be really careful about looking at markets with hindsight um, and going, what are the opportunities moving forwards across these? But I guess my observation is that when I've looked at this in the past, it really depends on what happens in water availability across the water year as to the implications of this because uh, I saw many, I've seen many circumstances over the years where um, when 
South Australian irrigators have been trying to rebalance their accounts uh, late in the water year, that they've been paying very high values and, and often top dollar, particularly in a market that is rising um, over time. And so not knowing about this earlier actually would have come at a uh, financial cost in, in those circumstances. So it really depends on what's happening in the market as to what the implications are in terms of the cost. I think I'm always a fan of more information. I think you're better off knowing about these uh, need for balancings uh, sooner rather than later, in, in my opinion. But Simo, you've looked at this as well. Yeah, no, Rod, I, I agree with your views there. And it's, it's, it's in general, the, the allocation market, uh, it's, it's, it's driven by the, the broader availability uh, drivers uh, and obviously supply and demand. Obviously, you know, at, at a times when there are many irrigators looking to, to balance their accounts at the same time and can be a significant driver, driver momentarily and it can have an impact on prices. But broadly speaking, yeah, I, I think it's the broader terms that sort of uh, dictate the market price, broader drivers. Uh, going through a couple more here. So some, I guess, uh, processy type things, people asking about what's happening with the slides and YouTubes and that sort of thing. So obviously they will be loaded up after the session. So just confirming that um, these sessions will be loaded up or this session will be loaded up onto YouTube um, and some of the information session as part of the breakout will also be put up on YouTube so that you've got the ability to look at this um, and do it afterwards. Um, there's a few policy questions that are emerging. People asking what's going to be the potential outcome of things like the ACCC review or the 450 gig. Um, but unfortunately, not going to be able to um, comment on those. This is about um, water market uh, literacy and information more so than trying to speculate on um, what policy decisions will be taken. Um, I've just also been advised that the YouTube is, isn't going to happen straight away. So it's not going to be available at 3 p.m. Um, but we're working on getting that up and available um, shortly after. Um, and we'll email you all uh, when it is available so that you can have access to it then. Um, I think that's the end of the key questions that I can see, or all the, all the questions that have emerged thus far. So, and I think we're right on time. So at this point in time, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this session. Uh, I hope it's been helpful and, and useful to you. Um, there are two breakout rooms which we're about to open up in five minutes time. So um, they'll each run for 30 minutes each and then give you an opportunity to change from one to the other. Um, bring your questions to those sessions if you didn't ask them now. Um, and thank you so much for your time and participation in this session.